And now we will go to the UK, where the former chief medical officer in the UK, the most senior medical advisor, and today she is uh, a professor and a UK special envoy on AMR for the UK. Please welcome uh, Dr. Dame Sally Davis. Hello there. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. What a pleasure to be with all of you today and a privilege to follow those words from the Crown Princess um, Victoria, whose commitment and leadership to the Sustainable Development Goals is helping make change around the world. And I'd like to thank the organisers of the Uppsala Health Summit for bringing us here today. And this is real collaboration in action. It's great to follow on from both Otto Cars and Keith Sumption, because after all, we're all seeing the firsthand the devastation and grief that's caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. In rich countries, even more than poor countries, we're angry and frightened by the knock-on effects to jobs and poverty, to food supplies and security, to justice, equality and stability. This has to be a wake-up call to all of us, because we can and must prevent AMR from this, doing the same to us and our children. So while the world is thinking about pandemics and global health in new ways, partly driven by that fear and sadness at the devastation we've seen over the past year, I've been talking about how COVID-19 is the lobster dropped into boiling water, making a lot of noise and, and as it dies. But AMR, right under our nose, though people aren't seeing it, is the lobster put into cold water and heating up slowly, but the suffering is there and it will die. I know you all understand why AMR is a big problem and why it's an all-encompassing threat to, as Keith showed us, food safety, to global health security and equitable opportunities. And on the one hand, you've got people like me who make the case for AMR being the most existential threat facing humanity, that along with climate change, it's the greatest challenge facing future generations. On the other side, and I do get it, the sad reality is that many people around the world don't understand AMR or what they can do to help mitigate it. You know, according to a recent report, only 19% of adults here in the UK think that AMR is the most serious threat to global health. Even more starkly, less than half of adults in the UK know what they can do to help tackle it. Global health challenges don't respect borders. Your Uppsala summit on AMR plays a key role, but these impact us all. And that doesn't mean change can't start with each and every one of us separately, but there's no time to wait for the whole world to get on board with this. We've got to get on with making change. It's the job of all of us here today to make our efforts more than the sum of their parts. Everyone every sector and every country has a role in this. Some know their role, but I've, as I've just been saying, some don't, and they need our help. Everyone has to help. The most important thing that each and every one of us can do is not specific to AMR, actually. It's to wash our hands. We can all do this, assuming we have water and soap, and we're all much more aware of the need to practice good hygiene and infection prevention measures because of the current pandemic. But we do have to help those three billion people across the world who don't have soap and water at home, the most basic of measures to protect against COVID-19 and other infections. I'm delighted that the UK is partnering with Unilever to provide hygiene products to parts of the world that lack sanitation. We're also launching a mass awareness campaign across traditional and social media tailored to communities to change behavior on hand washing. But if we want to see behavior change in individuals, we need to enable change at a broader level. Thanks to our UK Fleming Fund, a pharmacy in Ginger in Uganda has been manufacturing its own hand sanitizer using local ingredients. That can partially compensate for the lack of reliable water sources in public health and public hospitals, an intervention that makes a difference for patients and healthcare practitioners alike. We're beginning to talk, as you heard from Otto, about antibiotics and anti-infectives being central infrastructure for the modern health system. 
Antibiotics are the tools that our healthcare heroes rely on to treat their patients effectively. They are AMR specific, and we all need to handle antibiotics with care, which is increasingly hard to do when faced with pressure, especially on COVID-19 wards. After all, we've seen that around 75% of COVID-19 patients receive antibiotics, despite experts saying that only 3.5% of patients being hospitalised for bacterial co-infection need them. The UK's National Clinical Trial for COVID-19 treatments actually recently found that azithromycin had no clinical benefit for patients hospitalised with COVID-19, resulting in a recommendation to our hospitals and general practices not to use this antibiotic to manage COVID-19. But I know stewardship is easier said than done. And I hope that exciting new innovations, including apps from the World Health Organization to guide prescribing in the community and hospital setting will help people. The point is not to prevent anyone from receiving the treatments they need, but to ensure that people can access them when they really need them. And like with COVID-19 treatments and vaccines, this needs to be equitable and affordable and still meet the expectations of doctors and patients. As essential healthcare infrastructure, antibiotics are valuable when they are used, but also when they're on the shelf, ready to be deployed. Ideally, we're aiming for a Goldilocks storybook scenario for antibiotic use. Not too little, not too much. The cost of developing, registering and marketing antibiotics is high. But pricing has seen a race to the bottom, and pharmaceutical companies have few incentives to invest in antibiotics. So we have a lack of innovation, which compromises access for patients and undermines modern medicine for every country. The pharmaceutical, oh, the pharmaceutical industry have a role to change this. We told them, and they did listen. The new AMR Action Fund launched, launched last summer is an industry-led initiative supported by the IFPMA, Wellcome Trust, and the European Investment Bank. And over 20 leading pharmaceutical companies brought together with the aim of delivering between two and four new antibiotics to market over the next five years. This wide-reaching collaboration of stakeholders shows us what can be done when people collaborate and work together and of course, I'm so glad that both Sweden and the UK are thinking outside of the box on how to further shape a sustainable market for antibiotics. Both of our reimbursement schemes guarantee availability and access for patients, while also guaranteeing revenue to producers each year. In the UK, our so-called Netflix model of subscribing to antibiotics will, we hope, bring two new antibiotics to patients. These treatments will address disease areas of key importance internationally and specifically address key unmet needs in the UK. The innovative approaches being trialled by you in Sweden and the UK now depend on other countries pursuing similar innovative incentive mechanisms to test similar models in their own domestic markets. And I'm hugely excited by the Pasteur Act in the US that is coming into the House because that would ensure the availability of drugs and establish for them a delinked payment model. It's a bipartisan effort, and so we're hopeful, and it would represent a huge signal both to the US and the world if it goes through. We all know AMR's complex, which is why the private sector do have a role to play in every step, and we need to encourage it. It's welcome news that McDonald's are working to eliminate the highest use of eliminate the use of the highest priority, critically important antibiotics by 2027. I just wish it was this year. In the UK, six of the 10 leading supermarket companies have now banned routine use of antimicrobials in their food supply chains, growth promotion and prophylaxis. This shows that change can happen. We now need consumers to put even more pressure on suppliers to change the way their food is produced. And this is why the UK government, along with our friends at FAIR, the UNPRI and the Access to Medicine Foundation, have launched the Investor Action on AMR initiative. 
We're encouraging investors to align with best practices on AMR in supply chains, infection prevention and control, biosecurity, investing in protein and livestock production where antibiotics can be used, but they're used responsibly. I'm delighted that 12 global investors and financial institutions have already signed up. Together, the 12 investors manage over $4.8 trillion worth of assets and include some of the largest asset managers and institutions globally, including Nordea Asset Management from Sweden. I'm also encouraging my students here at Trinity College to lead AMR activism and encourage companies to do better for them and the generations that follow, a bit like climate activism. After all, youth has an unparalleled influence and role in AMR, and we've got to foster it and make them hold us to account. If we want to create a ripple effect of awareness, we need to embed AMR in children's education, giving them a role to learn about AMR, tell their friends and families about it. Indeed, in the UK, our eBug campaign, which is in 40, 24 languages, includes resources and activities for schools, including games, and even encourages classmates to work together to investigate the cause of an outbreak of foodborne illness at a dinner party. In our era of mass information and misinformation, education and clear, accessible information is more important than ever. In Australia, 44% of respondents to a population survey incorrectly thought antibiotics could treat or prevent COVID-19. We've got to change this knowledge. And then maybe we can work so that the behaviours follow. So let's make the most of the huge public appetite for real-time data that COVID-19 has highlighted. Let's get the same data for action for AMR and share so people care about it and act on it. After all, we manage what we monitor but at the moment, it's very difficult to have a precise picture of the global burden of AMR. We simply don't have the data, especially in low and middle income countries, so we have to use proxies. A world first study funded by the UK Wellcome Trust and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has just used geospatial modelling in using household surveys to estimate that global antibiotic consumption increased by 46% between 2000 and 2018. Some of this is welcome, it's improved access. It's about development, but worryingly, we know there's bad use in there. The MR world can look to climate change as an example of how science has informed behavior change. And Professor Carls mentioned the intergovernmental panel, um, the independent panel on evidence for action against antimicrobial resistance, which is going to collate evidence on future risks with the aim being to set meaningful targets at local, national and global level and function like that intergovernmental panel on climate change. But so far, perhaps the most important and exciting development is the establishment of the Global Leaders Group on AMR. The members, including heads of state, ministers, private sector and civil society representatives, are bringing their expertise, energy and influence to catalyse global attention and action to fight AMR. I am honoured to be on the Global Leaders Group alongside Minister Hallengren from Sweden, who will be joining the next session today. As a group representing that embodies the One World, One Health approach, I hope we use our collective influence and political capital to bring other stakeholders, both public and private, on board. We're working with the UN community, the WHO, FAO, as you've heard, Organization for Animal Health and the UN Environment Programme to bring our ideas together and bring them to life. So 2021 is already shaping up to be an important year for global health, animal health and environmental policy. Later this year, the UK will also um, host the G7 presidency, an opportunity to work with international partners to build back better, better from COVID-19. AMR will be a shared priority for governments to strengthen global health security and prevent future crises. We are all pushing for the better stewardship of existing antibiotics and to reinvigorate the development of new ones while making sure the antibiotic supply chain is safe, secure, transparent, 
and has shared standards that we can all rely on. Under the UK's leadership, the G7 will try to strengthen R&D innovation and patient access to the whole world. Behaviour change doesn't happen overnight, but we need to encourage everyone to play their roles and act as leaders in their own communities and sectors. If AMR is to have a voice as a global challenge, then we need to give everyone a voice in it. And I look forward to working with you all to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Sally Davis.